A couple of weeks ago, I did a live stream code review with a few very talented junior developers. And I had basically five pieces of feedback that were pretty consistent as I was going through this of things that they should really be considering. And I think these five tips will help take your code from looking like a junior developer to something more like a senior developer. So let's go ahead and get into it. Now, the first one is about destructuring properties off of an object if you're going to then subsequently use those properties. All right, so you can see an example. We still actually have some refactoring we can do in this. But in this case, we have our subscriber here and we're gonna reference two properties of this subscriber object. So in this case, we get the email property and the verify property, and then we can just reference these down below. Now, the alternative would be if we didn't destructure this, so if we commented out this line, we would have to write subscriber.verified, and then below we would have to reference subscriber.email, and then we would have to reference subscriber.verified as well. Now, what if we also wanted to reference other properties of this, like name or ID or something like this? So by destructuring these properties, we can actually get rid of a reference to verified or to subscriber here a couple of different times and save us some code. Now there's actually one little, uh, one little gotcha here that we could also improve that you may have already seen. And that is that we have our subscriber up top and then we check to make sure that we have a subscriber and then we check the email property. Now we could split these out into two separate pieces where we check the subscriber and then destructure down here and then check the email and do something according to that. Uh, so that's a little bit of a preference thing, a little bit of a small tweak, but the main idea here is if you're gonna reference properties off of an object multiple times, you should make sure that you're destructuring those properties and not retyping out the name of that object every time. It's basically just wasted code at that point. So this next one can actually be combined with destructuring properties if it makes sense. But in this case, I wanna focus on using the shorthand syntax when creating objects. Now the shorthand syntax basically says that we can have a key and a value that go into an object that have the same name. So this from would be the key of this property here and then also the value would reference the variable from that's already defined before. If we called this instead from email, then we'd have to type out this, this whole thing with from and from email. Same thing with reply to, if we called this the reply to email, and I don't actually know why we have a mix of cases in here, we should probably fix that. We would have to type this out as well. So what you can do is now just intelligently plan your variable names based on how you're gonna use them later in your code. So what this means is this becomes the from property, and then this becomes the reply to property. And then now we can get rid of this extra bit of code and just take the shorthand syntax to represent the key and the value for this property inside of this object, which I think looks a lot nicer and is much easier and quicker to write. All right, so this next one is about how you name things. And this is one of the longstanding jokes in programming is the two uh, the two biggest issues in, uh, in programming is one naming and then off by one errors or the biggest issue or whatever it is. I don't know what it is. Let me know in the comments below what the real expression is. But one of the hardest things to do with um, in programming is naming things. And so originally we had a function called update subscriptions. This has been a little bit picky, but I think what how you name your properties actually does become really important. And I'll actually show you a little trick here of how to rename these much more efficiently than what I did uh, just did in a second. So you'll see that. So what what update subscriptions implies to me is you're going to accept some sort of array and the array are the subscriptions that you're then going to update. Then you'll have to have some sort of uh, Boolean property that you're gonna use to reference there. So what I said in here is this actually to me implies an array, not that it updates all of the subscriptions that I have. So this is a subtle tweak, but I think makes a lot of difference when you actually craft and think about how you're naming your variables and functions because they give intelligence or uh, inference or whatever the word is for what that thing is actually going to do. So in this case, by just adding the small property of all, we're, we're actually implying all of these properties are going to be updated, not a subset based on an array that the user is going to pass. It also to me implies that I don't need to pass in the properties that need to get updated. Those are all going to be updated for me. So in this case, I think, again, it's a subtle thing, but I think this variable name is much more appropriate for what this actual function does. Now, one of the things that is super helpful, and actually um, they were pretty surprised to find this out, is if you have, let's see, let's search for a reference to this function, update all subscriptions. If you look in this, we have a reference to this function a couple of different times in this component. So we have this on click handler that references that. 
So the problem with if we were to rename this to go the opposite way, the way we had originally, if we were to do that that way where we just manually type in the new name and scroll down, you see we're going to have an error because that function no longer exists, which means we would have to go and update those accordingly like so. So now this will work, but there's a much better way inside of VS Code, and that is on Mac with uh, the function key F2. And this is basically a refactor rename, and what this means is as we type in the new name and press enter, it's gonna update all the references to that function, even if they're in different files. So you can see this has already been updated to match what that new function name is. So this is by far the easiest, and I think the best way to rename your functions. So this is probably the biggest piece of feedback that I have inside of this entire code review is handling errors. All right, so inside of here, we have an update subscriber to verified function. Now this thing returns a promise, but what this does is it references our Zeta client. This is where we're storing all of our data. And what could happen is during this update, this could throw an error. Notice that in our function, we're not actually handling that error here. That means that the error handling has to happen inside of this code that actually calls that function. So we still kind of have a to-do here to handle this, but most likely what you'll want to do is surround this with a try catch. Now this is something that never gets covered in tutorials or often doesn't, but almost all the things that you call that are going to make API requests need to have a try catch inside of it. So I would actually move all of this code down here to handle all of this, and then you'll need to add code to handle the catch for the error as well. Now, again, we still have a to-do in here to handle this, uh, but all code that you that you call some sort of API, most likely you're gonna need to handle errors inside of there using a try catch, or one of the things you'll see as well is you can destructure an error property from some functions and then check to see if that error did exist. So this is another pattern that works really well, where if you look inside of this send confirmation email, this thing uses the try catch itself, but then inside of the error, the handling of that error, it actually returns an object that has an error property. Now, I really like this pattern because then we can destructure that error here, check to see if it exists, and then return that error somewhere else as well. Otherwise, we assume we have our data here that is exactly what we wanted. So almost all of your API calls that you make inside of your project, you're going to need to make sure that you're handling errors. Otherwise, you're leaving yourself vulnerable to your application actually just stopping from some sort of unhandled error. And that leads me to the last piece of advice, which is to handle your errors consistently. Now, in this case, there are typically two different ways that you can handle errors. There's either using the try catch like we have here. This is a big try catch. Or you can define all of your functions functions to match this pattern of returning an object with either or a data property or an error property. And again, you can see this inside of here, where in this case, we're returning an object with an error property. In this case, we're returning an object with a data property. Now, I actually have another project where I have a better example of this that uses TypeScript to really define these return values. So this is Potluck Pal, which has been a fun project that I'm working on with Zeta as well for database, Sentry for error tracking and alerting, and then Kind for authentication. More on all of those on my channel. So if you're interested, make sure to follow. But inside of here, you can see that I have a return value type. And what this means is I'm defining in TypeScript a return value of generic type T that either is an object with a data property or it's an object with an error property. And you can see inside of one of these utils, for example, that each function that I define is going to return a return value of some type. So in this case, it's an events record, something that we query from our database. So if this happens successfully, we are returning the object with the data property that is the data we retrieve from the database, that is the events record. Otherwise, we're returning an, an object with an error property that then has the error message inside of it. Notice also all of this is handled inside of a try catch. So you'll also have to make sure you're handling those with your catch, but then returning the appropriate data that can then be consumed. So if we look for where we call create event, we can look for, wait for the response that comes back from create event. And then we check in here to see if error is actually a key in that object. We know we got some sort of error and we can do something with that. Otherwise, we know we can trust that this data came back. And if we look at this, so this is giving much more structure to something that could be kind of vague. And oftentimes you'll see people handle this in a lot of different ways. This gives you structure that you can use consistently throughout your entire application. So those are five tips that I gave from a recent code review with two very talented junior developers. 
If you're interested to stay up to date on the project that we're working on and other projects that I'm working on, you can subscribe to my newsletter at jamesqquick.com by scrolling all the way down to the bottom and adding your email there. In the meantime, I hope you enjoyed the video and I'll catch you next time.